And we're uh, about a minute out from getting started here. Just another good to see reminder everyone. that in the chat, go down to the bottom of the chat window and select everyone at that little blue button. And it is six o'clock. So hello everyone and welcome to the January NASA Night Sky Network member where, webinar. We're hosting tonight's webinar as usual from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. We're very excited to present this webinar with our guest speakers, Jessica Taylor and Jason Welsh from NASA's GLOBE program and Langley Research Center. Welcome to everyone joining us on the YouTube live stream. We're very happy to have you with us. These webinars are monthly events for members of the Night Sky Network. And, uh, and we're having a great time being able to broaden this participation through YouTube. For more information about the NASA Night Sky Network and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, check the links which will appear momentarily in the chat. And there we go. Before we introduce Jessica and Jason, here's Dave Prosper with just a couple of announcements. Hi folks, uh, I don't have anything new really. I uh, just wanna let you know, um, pins are shipping out. Still got a couple months of pins. Uh, if you're curious about uh, um, more information about the outreach pins and how to order them, if you've not yet, um, you can go to bit.ly slash NSN pins 2021. And um, yep, just make sure you've added a couple of events for 2021. You're qualified to order the pins. There's more details at the link which is bit.ly slash NSN pins 2021. Um, just put that in the chat. Also, um, uh, since it's uh, 2022, uh, happy new year. Uh, just want to make sure uh, we're encouraging folks to add in some of their upcoming events. I know at this moment, it's a little uh, questionable about what you're going to be holding uh, as been the case the last couple of years, but uh, we've got some virtual events, some recurring ones you think you might be holding later in the year or will try to be. Uh, just add them in. Um, and um, I haven't run the report yet. I'll probably do it in several days. Um, you know, I'll be whole, I'll do it on the 15th. So you got till the 15th to do it. Um, so to add these upcoming events for 2022 to your club's calendars, and we will pick out of the events, uh, 20 random ones with 20 different clubs for a 4-H uh, uh, Galactic Quest uh, kit, which the link I just put in the chat as well. Um, so yeah, 20 clubs may win. Uh, just enter your events for 2022 to qualify. And uh, that's it for me with the fun goodies for now. Um, back to you, Brian. All right, thanks. And I just want to mention too that uh, it's never too early to start planning outreach events for the upcoming eclipses. And uh, it's very much in our mind because we just started a new program which uh, um, a NASA sponsored program having to do with eclipse outreach. And so stay tuned for a whole lot more information about that in the coming months. And so just Vivian two and, and a half years. I know it's going to, well, don't forget the, uh, oh, oh yeah, two and a half to, uh, that's the uh, annual, right? And then a half year later for the uh, total. Yeah, we get the, uh, oh yeah. A year and a half, close about to each a, other. a year and 10 months for uh, the annual. And so, you know, Definitely plan for that because it's going to be a great deep partial for everyone um, as well. All right, so stay tuned for more information. For those of you on Zoom, you can find the chat window in the Q&A window at the bottom edge of the Zoom window on your desktop. Please feel free to greet each other in the chat window or to let us know if you're having any uh, technical difficulties. You can also send us an email at nightskyinfo at astrosociety.org. If you have a question for our guest speakers this evening, please type it into the Q&A window. It will really help us keep track and know if we've answered your questions or not. And I'm going to hit the additional recorder here. All right. Welcome again to the January webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Jessica Taylor and Jason Welsh to our webinar. 
Jessica Taylor grew up in Florida where her love of thunderstorms led her to pursue a career in atmospheric science. Jessica's participation in GLOBE began in 2001 as a student at Florida State University. Now as a research scientist at NASA, Jessica is the principal investigator for GLOBE clouds. Dr. Jason Welsh has a background in research and data analysis. His expertise includes working with large meteorological data sets in exploring models for forecasting and air quality analysis. He has a PhD in atmospheric chemistry from St. Louis University. Please welcome Jessica and Jason. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate it. Um, Jason, before we kick off with any slides, um, do you want to share a little bit about uh, where people can find you specifically on our Zooniverse project as well? <laughs> sure, definitely. Um, yes, uh, so you're actually able to find me um, directly, I believe it's under, let's see, um, under the uh, chat or talk section of the Zooniverse page, uh, you should be able to then find me directly under that. So, yes. Yeah, so we'll share just a little bit about our um, corresponding complementary Zooniverse project called NASA uh, Globe Cloud Gaze. So if you search for Cloud Gaze on Zooniverse, you'll be able to find us. And uh, Jason really helps uh, keep the community together. And so he's gonna help us out tonight in the chat and if you um, enjoy chatting with him here, if you're on uh, Zoom, you'll be able to chat with him also on Zooniverse if that's of interest to you. So thanks again, everyone, for having us. And let me go ahead and share my slide deck. And someone give me a verbal if it does not work out. Otherwise, I'm going to assume you guys can see what we're talking about here. Yeah, and you can see it, Brian? Yep, it looks great. Awesome. So we are talking tonight about what to do when clouds take over the sky. And the answer, hint, hint, is join a citizen science effort with Globe Clouds. And I am Jessica Taylor, as I said, from, um, from NASA Langley Research Center. And I am thrilled to be talking about this. Hopefully you um, don't hate clouds because of how they might impact your view of the sky. Hopefully you're excited about them. Um, maybe you're not as excited about me. Uh, uh, maybe you're not as excited as I am, but hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll get a little bit more excited. Um, so as mentioned, I grew up in Florida. I grew up outside of Tampa which is the lightning capital of the world. And so I really loved watching thunderstorms and I developed this curiosity around lightning and was lucky enough to have a high school teacher encourage me to do some investigation on my own about lightning. And what I learned was that scientists were still learning a lot about lightning. And I just thought that was really cool that you could have a job learning about something that interests you. And to me, that's kind of the definition of what um, scientist does and what science does. And so that's how I decided to go to Florida State um, to pursue a degree in meteorology. And that's where I first learned about the GLOBE program, which is the program and project that we're talking about tonight. And through the GLOBE program, I participated as a student in making daily measurements of various weather variables. And let me tell you, in Florida, in Tallahassee, going out every day was quite a bit of dedication because it was sticky and it was sometimes yucky. And I still climbed the steps all the way to the top of the building, the meteorology building, um, to record and observe the sky uh, record temperature, precipitation, relative humidity. We collected all these different variables, including aerosols, and I started to get interested in that as well. And what I got from that program was this great experience in doing science and really 
honing in my skills as a scientist. And that is what I credit to this day for really giving me confidence in being able to see myself as a scientist and to be able to wind up at NASA and NASA Langley Research Center where I work now doing both atmospheric science as well as leading this project for GLOBE. And my major professor at Florida State University, Dr. Paul Ruscher, was the GLOBE Clouds Principal Investigator. And I feel fortunate that that's the position that I get to hold now. Um, so just a little bit more about me. Um, we were talking, if you joined early on, about cats. I have two kitty cats. Um, that are in our household that we love very much. And uh, NASA is very much an all in the family sort of situation for us. So my spouse is a climate scientist, also works at NASA. And actually this photo is a little old now, looking at um, my little girls there. Um, they're nine and seven now, um, but they were at the NASA daycare center when they were this little age. And so we, there, there's a lot of NASA talk in our house. Um, but some of the other things that we like to do and talk about is I am a Latin dancer, was a Latin dance instructor. And so I still like to teach and, and do dance. Um, but other things that I like to do are maybe things that I'm not necessarily an expert in. So for example, I really love projects. Bud Burst is an, uh, another citizen science program that I've participated in. And I really like tracking plant phenology. I can't say that species identification is my strong suit, um, but just the idea of plant phenology is how I've been able to appreciate biology more coming from a physics background. And then of course, Project Feeder Watch, I just love, 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 love to watch the birds in my backyard. And I have actually not been back to work um, since the pandemic. NASA has been for the most part closed but I sit at my kitchen table just so I can watch my bird feeder every day. And so I encourage you to think about um, these passions that you have. And sometimes we're not necessarily experts in them, but they can still be very enjoyable to us. And we learn a lot from them. And I want you to kind of think about this idea of learning for a little bit and think about what you'd like to do and think for a moment about why do you like science? And I'm going to share with you some of my reasons for why I like being involved in science. And so for me, it's some of the wonder about the natural world. Discovering or learning something new. I mean, that's really what I fell in love with, with the idea of becoming a meteorologist. Um, for me, certainly getting outside, being outside. And getting to try on in a way, I mean, I realize I'm a professional scientist now, but, but in all of these activities, like even Project Bud Burst or something like bird watching or any of these is getting to um, practice being a scientist, right? So I got to do um, a, a sky watch party with friends of ours. And even there, I and my kids, I've brought my daughters with me and, my joy was seeing them observe, ask questions, and have the community share their knowledge, and then get to see my kids turn around and share that knowledge with somebody else. I just, I think it's really beautiful and something um, that ties, I think, a lot of us together who are all on tonight. And citizen science is one of the means by which to do that. And this idea of volunteerism and community science is really powerful. I think right now, especially as we are all trying to deal with the pandemic in our own ways and finding communities um, to engage with and being able to contribute something, something bigger. And you can even see in this um, beautiful diagram from the Citizen Science Association, is you know you can be in one of these areas of science and maybe that'll spawn your interest in something else and that's what i'm hoping tonight is that your love for astronomy can also encourage your love for observing earth science and particularly clouds so let me tell you a little bit more specifically about the globe program so globe um, started in 95, so it's got over 25 year history, 
which is pretty impressive considering that it's a project that is basically sponsored and supported by federal agencies. So NASA currently sponsors the GLOBE program and it does continue to receive support from NOAA, NSF and the Department of State. And it gets implemented by University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. It's international in scope. And so what you're doing um, wherever you are is the same thing that a GLOBE member in another part of the world is doing. We have lots of schools that participate. GLOBE originally started as a school-based program and working with students and teachers. And that was has been a really important component of the program in terms of how we approach both science and education as core values. There are over 50 protocols now, scientific protocols for data collection. And in 2016, something really important happened, and that's the program expanded to the general public to really engage all communities in this data collection. And since then, over 200,000 sci citizen scientists have joined us in doing this um, observation and data collection. And you can find on our website a number of publications. So hopefully that gets you a little interested. And for those of you who like to do some other things while listening, I encourage you to go um, on your mobile device and search for Globe Observer wherever you get your apps. It's a free app for Android or iOS devices, and it'll look something like the image on the screen here, Globe Observer. And how you participate is after you download the app, you create an account and you will need an email address um, to create that account because we'll need to verify that you're a person as opposed to a robot. And so go ahead and make sure you enter a valid um, email address. We'll send you a password and then that's it. You can get started and we'll show you a little more about the app here in a little bit. And um, specifically within the app, some of the functions that you can do in addition to clouds which of course I'm a little biased, it's my favorite, but actually they're all really cool. So you can take photographs of your land cover. And when I say land cover, I mean whatever is covering land, the ground, right? So that, in other words, that could be a water body. Globe trees, that tool turns your phone into a clinometer. So a clinometer is a tool we use to measure something um, that's tall, far away that we could you know, take a ruler or a measuring tape to do. That's pretty amazing that we can do that. And the other, the fourth tool in there is the mosquito habitat mapper. And so I know right now, many of us that are in the United States, here in the Northern hemisphere, we're experiencing winter. So hopefully we're not dealing with mosquitoes, but, when spring rolls around and summer is here, you might wanna take out the mosquito habitat mapper to help you better understand mosquito habitat um, and those breeding grounds. And it talks you through what they are and how you can eliminate them, um, which is a really awesome way to really engage in um, environmental and kind of community care. So, why would NASA really be involved in something like this? And, and what's that NASA piece and connection you might be asking? Well, for us at NASA, we use space as an awesome location to learn about our home planet, other planets, the universe. And from that vantage point of space, looking back at Earth, we get a very specific view, right? Looking, looking back down at Earth. Where is us here on the ground, we're actually looking up. And so from for clouds and for lots of these different parameters available in the app, that means that we have different perspectives entirely. And well, we're using different instruments, like we're using our eyes and maybe the, our cell phone uh, camera, whereas the satellite instruments, some of them are using infrared or lasers or many of these other um, technologies, but every single instrument gives us a little more information. It's like pieces of a puzzle. The more pieces we have, we can put together this picture. And so your um, observations from the ground looking up really help to complete that. And there are certain things that we're just much better at on the ground than a satellite is still. 
Um, so one of those things is if you think about looking back down on Earth from space, both clouds are white and snow is white. We were just talking a little bit about snow. Same color. So from a visible image, might be challenging to tell apart. Okay, what about something like infrared? Well, they're both cold. So believe it or not, that can still be a challenge um, in our, our satellite imagery. But obviously here on the ground, we have no trouble telling the difference between a cloud and snow. And so that's one of the things that you can record in the app is whether or not there's snow on the ground. Um, something else that's pictured here in this image are contrails. Contrails can be tricky uh, to observe from satellites, mostly because of, you know, if we're using a, a polar orbiting satellite, they're just not hanging around long enough in one location to really observe contrails. And so that can be a really unique thing that a citizen scientist on the ground can contribute to this database. So I want to tell you, um, share with you a little more about why NASA think cloud studies is so important. And this is short, it's just around, um, just over uh, a minute. There you go. When you see fluffy white clouds in a blue sky, you know you're usually in for a pleasant afternoon. A sky full of thundering dark clouds and you'd better find an umbrella. What could be easier than understanding clouds, right? Ha! When it comes to climate, clouds are far from simple. We know they're a very important piece of the puzzle, but they're hard to fit into the big picture. Why? One huge reason is that clouds both cool Earth by shading it from the sun and warm Earth like blankets, trapping the heat it gives off. Clouds cover around 70% of the planet at any given time, so they play a big role in determining how warm and how much water Earth gets. The thing is, scientists aren't sure how climate change is affecting clouds or how clouds are affecting climate change, whether they're tipping the balance towards more warming or cooling, and how this will affect our planet in the future. For example, some places may get more rain and some other places much less rain in the years to come as the climate changes. So NASA studies clouds from all angles to help scientists make their climate forecasts a lot less cloudy. Yeah, so that's a quick summary of why NASA is involved in this. NASA is involved in studying clouds because, well, it's important to a lot of aspects already that we know of in terms of weather, but it's also very important in understanding climate. And I would guess that even for many of you who are joining who may not think of yourself as a cloud expert per se, I think there's probably a lot about clouds that you do already know. And so take this picture um, as an example. So you're already familiar with the role that clouds play in blocking sunlight. So this is you know, very important to us, say like on a hot and sunny day, and we have a cloud that rolls overhead and it blocks, it reflects that sunlight. And so we feel cooler and we get shade. You're probably also very familiar with as you're setting up telescopes or something at night, you know that if it is a cloudy sky, but that also means it's gonna tend to be warmer because as the earth radiates energy back out to space, those clouds that are present then at night are going to basically trap that heat back in. So that's one quick thing that you might be able to tell somebody else if you were um, at an event and clouds roll in and you're looking for something to share about clouds. But when you think about that example that you're really familiar with, um, we can use that to kind of build off of that and to try to understand this more complex picture and what that video was sharing too about how some clouds cool, but there are also clouds that tend to warm. So take this puffy cloud on the left of this diagram. And um, do you know what the um, name for that type of cloud is? So that's a cumulus cloud there. 
And whenever I say cumulus, my hands do this gesture of cumulus. Um, and cumulus is because you have this rising, sinking motion, and that's what makes it a puffy, puffy cloud. These cumulus clouds, particularly ones that are lower to the ground, they do tend to block incoming sunlight. And so those clouds really are cooling our Earth. On the other hand, we do have clouds like high, thin cirrus clouds that really they're so thin, they let all of the sun's light come through, and yet they're higher in the sky in terms of altitude, so they're much colder, and they wind up trapping that heat. So in this example, in this diagram, we actually see two different types of clouds, some clouds that cool Earth and other clouds that warm Earth. And that in the video is what we were talking about in terms of NASA's studies of clouds is trying to better understand not just which ones do we have um, the most of now, right now on average clouds help cool our climate, but how are clouds changing? And will those changes to clouds impact any of this balance or imbalance that we have? And so it's not enough for us to study and say, hey, there's a cloud somewhere. We wanna know even more about that cloud. What are some of the descriptions of that cloud? Does it let sunlight in or doesn't it? So in GLOBE, we identify the various cloud types. And we typically use these 10 cloud types or what you see in the app. And on the left side of this diagram here, we have our stratus type clouds. These are our stretchy, stretchy clouds that tend to go um, cover a lot of the sky, stratus clouds. And on the right side of the diagram, we have the convective clouds, our cumulus clouds. And so we describe clouds by this characteristic of stratus or cumulus. Um, the other thing that we can use to describe clouds is whether or not they're precipitating. And so only our cumulonimbus, our big thunderstorm of cloud, um, is our thunderstorm cloud and the only other type of cloud that rains there are nimbostratus and nimbostratus is probably going to give you your ongoing lighter drizzles for example that steady drizzle now the other thing that we use to describe clouds um, is we want to know how, how how high up in the atmosphere they are and so as we go up, you can see that the names of the clouds change. So a stratus cloud at the mid-level is altostratus, and a cumulus cloud at the mid-level is altocumulus. A stratus cloud at the highest level is cirrostratus, and a cumulus at the high level, you guessed it, is cirrocumulus. Sometimes we can use the size of a puff of this cumulus to help us uh, guesstimate how high up it is in terms of is it a cirrocumulus, is it an altocumulus? That's how we can help to kind of gauge those by the size of the puff. Um, on the stratus side, we're going to try to use some form of a light source. In other words, the sun or if it's um, a bright moon to tell us a little bit more about that stratus cloud. So if you can't see the sun, it's probably stratus low level. If the sun is dimly lit, it's probably alto stratus. And if you can really see most of the sun, it's cirro stratus. And we'll also talk about what else you can get with a cirro stratus type cloud around the sun or moon. Um, and then of course, another cloud type is cirrus. So those are the wispy clouds that you see. And then contrails are really, as I mentioned, another important one to share with us at GLOBE if you see those. Now, I mentioned the really cool phenomenon, um, love looking at optics of clouds. And so this of course is a gorgeous halo. Now the halo here, um, let me see in my notes where this is taken. Uh, so this is from um, the APOD site. And uh, this picture is from Sweden. And we know that those clouds there in that image are a zero type cloud because the light is coming through. And then we're getting that halo because 
it's ice crystals. And these ice crystals are, um, uh, they're hexagonal shape. And so the refraction is at 22 degrees that gets you this beautiful looking halo. So if you saw something like that, you know that it's a serotype cloud. And this is pretty um, common to be able to see around the sun or moon. Um, but I wanted to share another photo with you that was on the NASA website because this is some really cool and amazing optics here. So you've got a halo going on. You've got corona. You've got some arcs there, um, what we would call uh, sun dogs or moon dogs, depending on your light source. This is pretty neat. Um, so these are some of the really cool pictures that you can get when clouds mix with your sky, um, particularly our serotype clouds. And so let me see, uh, this photo was from Canada and it was a professional photographer who happened to be on their way to do something that morning and saw this beautiful image and actually used uh, two different uh, filters to be able to get this. And I, that is an exceptional piece of work there. Um, something else that's really cool when we talk about our night sky and clouds are, of course, noctilucent clouds. So noctilucent clouds um, can be found, um, typically we think of them as polar, right? So polar mesospheric clouds is what we call them, PMCs. And, but we have been able to see them at a little bit lower uh, latitudes every now and again. And um, this is very popular to, of course, observe. And at NASA, there has been a mission called AIM um, that has been studying these. And I wanted to show you this video of another uh, NASA mission that has been studying noctilucent clouds as well. So let me play this also very short. A balloon mission from NASA observed rare electric blue clouds. These are polar mesospheric clouds, or PMCs. They are only visible during twilight and form above Earth's polar regions at the upper reaches of the atmosphere. As Earth's uppermost clouds at around 50 miles high, PMCs are composed of ice crystals that glow a bright blue or white when reflecting sunlight. They are extremely sensitive to environmental factors like water vapor and temperature. Atmospheric. Okay, sorry, I cut you off and I know you were probably excited to learn a little bit more about that. Um, but feel free to share for us um, a blue in the from chat. NASA we'll be able observed to check rare a little bit. electric blue. Let me have um, share with us if you have had the opportunity to capture any of these really cool um, nighttime cloud effects. And you might be wondering, huh, if only there was a way to share these amazing nighttime cloud effects or these other really cool cloud scenes with NASA. Why, yes, there is. That is exactly what the Globe Observer app, um, one of the reasons that it's been developed and that we're promoting it is because it's a great opportunity for you and others to capture what you're seeing in the sky and share it back with the Globe community and NASA researchers. So how would you use the app? So, uh, so pretend you've already downloaded the app, you've logged in. Um, in this video that we'll watch together, um, our participant here is going to go ahead and open the app and start to make an observation. And I wanted to share this with you so you got an idea of um, basically how quick a, an observation or uh, recording it in the app can be. So let's take a look. Nope, let's go back. <laughs> let's try again. There we go. Um, this is just some instrumental music in the background. So if you can't fully hear it, no problem. So the app, one exciting thing is you do not need Wi-Fi for it to work while you're recording. You only need Wi-Fi to send us the data. So that's something to keep in mind. When you open it, we'll be able to identify your location and time. Start to tell us what does your sky look like? So if it's obscured, that means 
more than 25% of the sky is covered by something, that's when you would use that obscure terminology. Cloud cover is a very important um, parameter for scientists um, to use. And so we really would appreciate you sharing cloud cover. And we'll ask you a little bit more then about what you see in the sky. So what's the deepest, deepest shade of blue you see is sky color. And that, so that's kind of looking up. The sun is typically behind you to see the deepest shade. And then we want you to look across the horizon and tell us your visibility. Sky color and visibility are very heavily linked to your weather as well as the air quality and um, aerosols in your area. And then you start to use the guide to help tell you based off of the things I was talking about before, the shape, um, other characteristics to tell us the cloud types. Opacity is how much light is coming through that cloud. And so you would use the overall opacity that you think it is. And I mentioned before, sometimes satellites need help understanding what's on the surface. And so your report of what's going on on the ground is really important. Now, the fun part for you and for the researchers are the photos. So you turn your phone and start capturing photos in all cardinal directions, up and down. And then don't forget to send us your data. That's a really important part too. And like I said, you can keep that data on your phone if you um, don't want to use your data plan or you're um, just in a location where you don't have a uh, good service. Um, you can leave all of that data on your phone and then send it to us when you come back on to uh, Wi-Fi or something like that. And I think that part's really helpful um, to know that you can do that. So once you have the app downloaded, that's how you would make sure that it can work on and not data connection Wi-Fi mode. So uh, let me tell you what I want to do with the rest of our time. I want to walk through some of the really key things that the app is going to ask you about. And then I want to make sure to share with you a little bit more about the upcoming cloud data challenge that we have going on. So we mentioned cloud cover. So you don't have to be super specific here in cloud cover. You see that we actually give you a, a list of categories. And so you're going to be estimating for us the cloud coverage into these categories, the total cloud cover, and then also telling us the cloud cover by height. In other words, what's the total cloud cover at the low, middle, and highest level? That's also really helpful to us, and when, particularly when we're comparing data to what the satellite reported. Now, if you're still feeling a little uncomfortable about identifying cloud type in particular, inside the app is something called the cloud wizard. And the cloud wizard is really a dichotomous key. In other words, it says, do you see this? Yes or no? Um, so for example, here it says, is it a flat gray blanket looking cloud? Yes or no? And it'll walk you through and show you a number of examples of photos of that type of cloud. So you can um, it better help determine what cloud type it, there is. And that's really, really cool. And then in the cloud wizard, we also have some tools to help you determine tran um, opacity, whether or not it's transparent, uh, which would be most of the light comes through translucent, some opaque, meaning it's blocked. Another way to tell about opacity is to look at your shadow or the shadow of something else on the ground. If it's a really crisp um, shadow, so you can really see your defined edges. For me, that's like the curls of my hair. Uh, that might be a transparent cloud above you. If your shadow looks kind of fuzzy, then it might be a translucent cloud. If you really can't see your shadow, then maybe perhaps that light is blocked. And so that would be an opaque cloud. Hopefully that's kind of helpful to you. S the surface conditions. Again, this is thinking about yes or no. Is this in my surroundings? Is this in a space that if a satellite was looking overhead, looking down, is there snow or ice on the ground? Is there standing water, mud, dry? Leaves on the trees, this is not just about whether or not um, 
your tree changes with the season. This is, are there leaves, yes or no? And that would include things like pine needles. Are pine needles on the tree? That would be a yes then, leaves are on the tree. The photos are the most fun part. So um, it might be hard to see on your screen, but there's a little circle that appears on your cell phone camera. And we have letters for the cardinal direction. So N for North, S for South, and you're trying to get them lined up into that circle. The reason for that is we are helping your phone take a picture at just the right angle. We don't want it right at the horizon. We want it just above the horizon. Because when we make observations of clouds, we actually don't want to look right along the horizon because that tends to be distorted in terms of the cloud shape as well as the cloud cover. So we use something in GLOBE, in the GLOBE protocol, we call it something like the three-fifths rule. So you put your hand out to the horizon. Oh, you can't see me in the picture. Three-fifths up also tends to be where your eyes are. So here up is about where you wanna look. And that's exactly how we have it programmed for your phone to be able and everyone to take a picture at the exact same angle. So we do have uniform and uniformity in that when we're taking a look at your pictures. And this is what it might look like to us. We'll get those pictures in and um, it's awesome to be able to see those pictures if you're able to take them. Now, something that's really cool is that we at NASA Langley, um, so the whole team, we get to see those photos and that data coming into us. And then our team at NASA Langley matches them if there was a satellite overhead. So we match to Aqua, Terra, and Calypso in terms of polar orbiting satellites, as well as a number of geostationary satellites, which basically means that almost any time of day now, you can get what we call a satellite match. So we will reply to you, reply to that email that you shared with us, uh, a table that looks like this with your observation on the far right. And then uh, in the data table, we will also share what the satellite recorded. And it's kind of fun to take a look and to see where there are differences and where there are agreements. And remember, that just because there's differences doesn't mean that you're wrong. It could mean that the satellite couldn't see it because of that perspective that we were talking about. And so I encourage you that even if you're feeling a little hesitant about that observation, to make sure you send it in. Because citizen science, and at least definitely for us in Globe Clouds, it's crowdsourcing at its finest. The more observations we get in from the community, the better we are at being able to describe the cloud scene that was going on. And so there's no better time to practice it than right now during our 2022 Cloud Data Challenge. And so it is starting January 15th and running through February 15th. Now, I want you to remember, we accept your observations uh, before then, and please continue to make observations afterwards. Um, but during this data challenge, we're really asking people to think about and really make it a priority to make observations if it's safe for you to do so. And during the cloud challenge, we'll be sharing out a number of features on our Facebook page and on Instagram from a number of our scientists talking about clouds. And we're really taking a look at clouds in a changing climate and trying to ask and understand stories from our community members about how clouds have been changing. So I do have one more short video for you about participating in this data challenge. Did you know that clouds can both warm and cool our planet? Keeping an eye on clouds helps NASA study our climate. We need your help capturing data about clouds where you live. NASA Globe Cloud Challenge 2022, Clouds in a Changing Climate. January 15th to February 15th, 2022. Participate by taking cloud observations with the GLOBE program's GLOBE Observer app. or by classifying cloud photos through CloudGaze on the Zooniverse online platform. Learn more at observer.globe.gov slash cloud challenge 2022.
if you did not get a chance to write did down you, that website, did you know we'll that clouds sure. can both warm oh, and cool? Oh, no, okay. okay, we'll be sure to share it in the chat in a little bit here. Um, but if you didn't catch it, there are actually two ways to participate. Um, if it's safe for you to go outside, we would love for you to make observations using the GLOBE program's GLOBE Observer app and just following through with what I shared with you. If you can't go outside or if you also want to try out another way to contribute, you can do so through NASA GLOBE Cloud Gaze. This is our Zooniverse project where we take the photos that the GLOBE community members have sent in and we push them to Zooniverse for the Zooniverse community to do another round of identifying what's in those cloud photos. So if you participate in both, you might be able to see some of your photos make it from the GLOBE program uh, app all the way to the Zooniverse platform. And I have to tell you that doing some of these Zooniverse uh, identifications is one of my favorite things to do when I just have a little bit of downtime or I'm waiting for an appointment um, to do it in the app or you can do it on the website. And it's a really great way to also see the many different clouds that exist. And it starts to get very interesting to recognize that there are clouds from other parts of the world than wherever you are currently located at. So that's a really fun way to, for you to contribute during this data challenge as well. So if you can, do both or pick one of the ones that you want to try out. So that was a lot of information, I know, um, but I want to kind of wrap it up and really bring it back to some perspective that we started out with this evening in talking about community science, really, as, again, this opportunity for discovery. So I encourage you to turn your cloudy skies into a citizen science opportunity and utilize the information that we talked about tonight, along with the app itself and our resources to help you in doing that and to help encourage people to make observations and ask questions about something else in their sky. Um, and really to share your passion. I know that you are all joining because you are passionate about science and passionate about um, sharing that with um, community members. I know they talked about outreach programs. So I encourage you um, to get others excited and participate in science discovery in whatever way that they then feel passionate about. So thank you so much for your time. And I am looking forward. Um, Jason and I will be here to answer some of your questions. Thanks so much. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica. And actually, we've had a few questions. We, you, we really encourage people to put their uh, questions in the Q&A window. That way we don't lose them. But there's been some good ones in the chat. And oh, and please don't let me forget to talk about the eclipse if nobody's asked about the eclipse yet. And I know that Jason has uh, asked a couple of things and uh, answered a couple of things in the chat, but I think that it would be worthwhile uh, for the people who haven't seen that to uh, maybe, um, you know, revisit those. Um, but let me, uh, let me, <clears throat> here's one. Susan put this uh, in the Q&A window. And so she said, um, uh, what if there are obstructions like buildings or trees in some directions? Great question. So a perfect location would not have these obstructions. You would basically be in the middle of a field making observations. Um, but GLOBE and I think a lot of community science programs have realized that uh, perfect um, can be the enemy, right? And so in our program, just like many others, we're asking you to make observations if you think you can still get some good information to us. And you would be able to identify in the GLOBE program, you would be able to identify your site and tell us about some of those obstructions. Um, or when you're making those photos, that's another great way for us to have a better understanding of the location that you're making the observation from. So by all means, do your best to get like the best loca viewing location that you can. 
um, but it's absolutely not a problem to send us photos that might have a tree or some buildings in it. We understand that that's exactly what happens when you live in the real world. Yeah. I really love the, uh, the idea about it. when you put this in, if there's a satellite connection um, with that with the image. And Stuart asked the question, what are the relationships between globe and satellite like those? Yeah, so we, um, so we have relationships with a number of different uh, satellite missions and the data that is available to us at NASA. And so some of the GOES satellites, right? So we've got NOAA and NASA connection there, um, but we match to Aqua and Terra. Um, and those two satellites have an instrument on board called Ceres. Um, they have other instruments as MODIS is another one, but the Ceres instrument is a long-standing instrument helping us better understand climate and the role clouds play in blocking solar radiation, um, whether that's incoming or outgoing, and really focused on energy budget, better understanding incoming energy versus outgoing energy. And that series instrument in particular has been um, a project of NASA Langley Research Center. So that's actually how we got started in Globe Clouds doing satellite matches. We were doing it as an additional validation source for this series instrument. Fast forward years later, um, we're not necessarily needing it to validate that particular algorithm for the series instrument, um, but rather being able to use it as complementary data now. Because I think we've been able to move citizen science to an era now where researchers are seeing it as complementary data, another type of data with another type of instrument. And so that is the Aqua and Terra satellite. We really work closely with the Ceres science team. And then the Calypso satellite mission is also a NASA Langley mission that we work very closely with. And then um, in order to process a lot of that Ceres data, we actually use geostationary data. And so we um, match with a number of GOES satellites. Um, this community may know that the next GOES satellite is scheduled to launch in March 1st, I believe is the current date. And when that becomes operational, we'll be matching to that as well. So if you're interested, um, so the GOES satellite data will, or geostationary data basically is almost always there for us to do the match. If you're real excited about polar orbiting satellites, there is a way in the app to click on um, satellite flyover notifications and you can have your phone basically send you a little alarm or ping you when the satellite's going to be overhead, one of those polar orbiting ones, which is pretty cool. So that's interesting. And, and it kind of makes me wonder too, because sometimes uh, these agencies get compartmentalized and a lot of the missions you're noting are, are NASA missions and those of course is a NOAA mission. And uh, so is there any crossover between uh, the research being done and, and the use of this by the scientists in the NOAA um, realm? Yeah, great question. So, um because we do have NASA and NOAA work very closely together on all of those geostationary satellites and even the upcoming launch really is a, a NASA NOAA activity. Um, so that data, right? So the NOAA oper uh, operational um, satellites, we're still at NASA needing to use that for our uh, cloud algorithms. So we have that partnership there. And then what's great is that because the GLOBE program has really for a long time received this uh, multi-agency support from NASA, NOAA, and other federal agencies, we do see a lot of that partnership going on. And so the data is, is made available and we talk about it at very various science team meetings, but it's also publicly available for anyone to use. And, you know, everybody on this call can go to the GLOBE website, um, go to observer.globe.gov to pull down that data and even get that satellite match data. All right, well, let me pull Jason in here and see if uh, Jason has anything to add. And so if we can get Jason to turn on his camera and I can highlight him. Hi there, yes. So I know that you uh, had answered a couple of questions there and um, and maybe uh, you have them more easily at hand. And if you think that any of those would be um, interesting for the group as a whole who perhaps didn't see the chat. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say, I mean, I guess in response to uh, Susan's question there, um, I would definitely say that, um, you know, once again, ideally, you know, we would like to get a photograph that doesn't have, you know, any sort of obscuration. Um, but when you think about it, when you when people are taking photographs, oftentimes they'll be out, you know, outside, and then they might be, you know, they might just walk out their door, and they might just snap some different photographs, but they're really not, you know, they may not be either paying attention to kind of where they're taking the photograph, um, or, or for, for each individual direction. Um, and, and so in that case, we sort of do ask that, you know, people do the best that they can do. That uh, the, and, and in terms of, you know, even if they can walk a little further, um, as, as long as it is safe to do, we don't want anybody getting injured. Um, but in terms of, you know, actually just being able to um, essentially be able to actually get these different photographs in different I'm directions. Not sure if we lost so. everyone or just. No, we're here. Fine. Yep, we're here. Yep. Can you guys hear us? I can hear Jason. I can hear you. Yeah. You sound good. Sorry. Maybe some uh, hiccup at the uh, in San Francisco office, possibly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and I believe there was another question I think that came through in the chat here, and I only see we kind of kind of answer different questions here. Um, and let's see here. Somebody else mentioned, um, and I think someone also mentioned, you know. Do you prefer observations when we see something special, or do you really prefer, you know, observations taken at about, say, the same time every day, even if there's nothing, you know, not anything uh, really special to see? And I think to answer that question more specifically, um, and I, I sort of briefly didn't uh, sort of answer that, but I think to answer that, um, you know, ideally, for, as scientists, we kind of like a nice you know, long-term uh, compilation of photographs. But um, it, it sort of depends on you. I mean, a, in terms of for data for us, we would really definitely prefer a, you know, every day would, would be great. But if you also see something that you, you know, that's up in the sky, that's also really great as well. So yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that, Jason. So a couple things you can think to do. If, if you do have a photo that has something interesting, in the section where you're, um, you do your photos, there's a box for comments. And so you can put a comment in there about that particular scene. So if there was something very interesting about it, or if you want to tag it, um, you know, one of these um, sort of special cloud types, you can do that. Um, but as Jason mentioned, you know, the title of our data challenge is really about clouds and a changing climate. And as you all know, for us to really understand changing climate, we need that long-term record that Jason's talking about. And so the more you can make observations, even on a day that might wind up being boring to you, so to speak, um, that is really helpful information to us at NASA. Um, and I see our time, and there was something else that I had had failed to put in the presentation, but it's very important for me to share with you guys, is the eclipse. So there was a mention of it's never too early to start planning for the solar eclipse. Um, having participated in doing the solar eclipse a few years back, I can also vouch for how important it is to start planning early. And one of the things that we do with Globe Clouds is we release a special feature of Globe Clouds during a solar eclipse. Um, which is an eclipse tool. And during that time frame of a solar eclipse, in the app, you would be able to not only tell us about the clouds that are going on, but you would also be able to track temperature. And so both things we would imagine are changing during the eclipse. And so this is a really cool way to engage community members in some sort of an outreach activity by tracking that before, during, and after, and of course during please enjoy the eclipse, um, but tracking that throughout. And so, for example, during the last eclipse, I was in Virginia, it was not totality, but we had a scene where we were able to see the temperatures drop and we had just a few cumulus clouds in the sky prior to the eclipse and we saw those dissipate right away as the eclipse passed and
trend that those temperatures dropped, which was pretty cool to be able to see. And so we have a lot of observations. And if that's something of interest to you, I encourage you to take a look at some of our publications that have come out recently on the solar eclipse and using some of the globe data. All right, that's a great point. So one of the things too, last, last thing, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, so with the challenge starting this Saturday, it, do you have some social media things that, that uh, people could uh, put out on their local social media for other people who weren't able to be here tonight? I know that I'm interested in, in broadcasting it on the ASP's um, social media general channels to everyone. So. Absolutely. So I'm going to put in the chat the website to the cloud challenge. And there is some information on there that you can share out with your own communities. And then if you want to follow us on whatever your preferred social media platform is by looking for the globe program. Um, we'll be posting the interviews that we're doing with scientists. They'll be coming out as Instagram reels. And you can see those publication dates posted on there. And that video that we shared tonight, the very short one at the end, talking about the data challenge that did just get posted today as well to NASA social media. All right. Well, thank you so much. That's all for tonight, everyone. Thank you, Jessica and Jason, for joining us this evening. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, February 15th, when Dr. David Williams from Arizona State University will bring us the story of NASA's mission to investigate Psyche, the largest M asteroid in the solar system. You can find an archive of all these webinars on the NASA Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. They are also on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel. So keep looking up and we will see you next month. Thank you all. Bye. Yep. Thank you, everyone. The recording has stopped. But we're still here for a minute, so, but that's okay. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jay, uh, Jessica and Jason. This is really great. It inspired me to uh, haul out my phone and get the app on my phone. And because I'm always out looking at clouds, it's kind of like, you know, why can't I take two minutes to uh, take some pictures to send to you guys too? So it's. Uh, yeah, we would love that. And I have to say, I mean, even